Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, although it's also a little bit interesting and unusual to be here because even though I am an academic and I do do research, I don't do anything with medicine. I don't do anything with big data. Um, in fact, I would say, based on uh, the talks I've seen t so far, that you would describe what I do as uh, little data. Um, and in fact, even as, insofar as I'm interested in medicine, and I'm certainly interested in medicine, I would say that I'm also very interested in little data there as well. I'm interested in extraordinarily small values of n. Uh, I'm interested in the case where n is equal to 1. See, this is the situation that I found myself in, or my family found itself in, about three years ago when we were told that my son was the first and then only case ever known of his particular ultra-rare genetic disorder. Um, and so when this happened to us, we had to start asking and answering a series of questions, questions which I think are being answered by a lot of people right now, which is, well, what do you do when you have an n of 1? And uh, how do you increase n? How do you find more patients for an ultra-rare disease? And once you've increased n, uh, how do you go about doing something with that community? Um, and I think the, the short version uh, to this is that you uh, use the internet. So there's a lot you can do with the internet today, and this is fantastic, because unless you live in North Korea, um, <laughs> you probably have access to the internet and things like Google. So uh, there's a lot you can do. So uh, even though I'm going to tell you the story of my son, Bertrand, this is a story that is in many ways uh, not unique anymore. It's being t retold many thousands of times over uh, in the wake of next generation sequencing, which is just unlocking a tirade of new disorders at an un unprecedented rate in human history. So uh, I think there's a lot of general principles that we can extract from the journey that we've been on. It's a journey that begins, as it does for so many in the undiagnosed and rare community, on undiagnosed island. Uh, it is an island where, as parents, you don't know why your child is suffering. Where, in our case, we didn't know why our child had seizures, why he had developmental delay, uh, why it was that he couldn't, for some reason, as Sharon mentioned yesterday, cry tears, uh, and why there was no way it would seem for us to help him. But it's also an island where you learn a lot about um, you know, this, this sort of quiet resilience uh, that's deep within humanity and the power of never giving up and never giving in. And we were sort of trapped on this island for, for four years. For 48 months, we lived on that island uh, with seemingly no way off until a crew of researchers from Duke University rescued us uh, in, a, in a groundbreaking application of exome sequencing to determine sort of its clinical efficacy. Uh, they went ahead and did trio sequencing for myself, my wife, and my son. And through the sequencing, we were able to find that he carried uh, two seemingly at that point in time unique mutations in his NGLI1 gene, resulting in loss of function, and that this seemed to be the cause of his particular disorder. And I say seemed to be because at the time, they were also telling us that, well, we don't have any other patients with the disease associated with this gene, but we're pretty sure this is it. Uh, so it was in many ways an, an N of 1 diagnosis. Uh, and uh, you know, along with that comes words and phrases, but I don't think should ever be told to any patient ever again, like not actionable. Like there's nothing you can do uh, because, l l listen, nobody else even has this. There's no research on this. There's, there's nothing to do at this point. Uh, so let me show you what not actionable looks like uh, in this day and age. So first of all, just getting an answer uh, counts for a lot because you go from many potential targets down to one uh, essentially immediately. And once you have a single target, you can start doing science. And in the absence of any traditional medication, it's my argument that science becomes the medicine. In fact, science becomes the action. And that's why I really don't believe that there is such a thing as a not actionable diagnosis anymore. Uh, you know, and from here, uh, we, we said, okay, well, we're going to do science. So we headed out to Dr. Hudson Fries's lab at Sanford Burnham, because he's one of the world experts in the pathways that happen to be involved in this particular gene, the NGLI1 gene, which encodes the enzyme N-glycanase. Uh, and he was able to sort of tell us you know, how far we'd come on our journey. He took us to what I call the, you know, the peak, of, peak of our diagnostic odyssey. And from this view viewpoint, he sort of showed us the landscape of where we'd come, how, far, how far we'd come, and ultimately how far we had to go if we wanted to really reach understanding treatment and cure. Uh, which, as we realized, was a lot further than we'd come so far. So with that in mind, we said, well, we're just going to keep taking steps. Let's, let's just keep going. Uh, but we realized there's no way we could do this alone. This was going to be a very difficult journey. So we said, well, we know, looking at the frequency of the loss of function alleles, uh, and at the time it was the Washington database for exomes, that there ought to be roughly 500 living patients out there with this disorder. So maybe we can find them. Uh, maybe we can build teams. 
And so, uh, you know, I, I said, well, let's go find these other patients. Let's see what we can do. And uh, uh, we engage in a bit of sort of ad hoc crowdsourcing. So, the, you know, at the time, I don't think there was sort of a systematic platform for engaging in something like this. So what I did is I designed a blog post uh, that was supposed to go viral and serve as a sort of reverse Google dragnet to find other patients and capture the interests of scientists that might have some input on what we should do with this particular disorder. So this is the, the intro to the post that I wrote. Um, and sure enough, it worked. Uh, this thing actually did go viral. Uh, and it did start to, to capture the attention of the internet. Uh, it was seen by uh, millions of people in a very short amount of time. And we started getting a lot of feedback. Uh, so what's amazing is that some of the, the, within, within weeks, we got actionable feedback that let us take what I would say was our first credible attack, therapeutic attack, on this disorder. Uh, so uh, I got an email from Dr. Richard Gaddy down at, at UCLA. And uh, he actually even offered to take my, my family out to dinner in Salt Lake City, which he did. Uh, and, and he explained to us uh, that he was working on a class of compounds called read-through compounds. And that with read-through compounds, you could potentially try to read through the premature stop mutation that I, my son had inherited from me and create, allow for the sort of the complete construction of the full protein. So we thought, okay, well, let's, let's try this. So he, he volunteered his materials, he volunteered his expertise, and he volunteered even to make lymphoblastoid lines. Uh, and, and so we, we, we went to Dr. Freeze and said, well, so you're an expert at recognizing this protein, so go ahead and try these compounds. And unfortunately, none of them worked. Um, but it wasn't necessarily disappointing. In fact, it was invigorating to think that going from not knowing what this was to within weeks being able to take credible attacks on it uh, was, it was actually quite inspiring and really encouraged us to keep going. So we continued a, a, a partnership with Dr. Freeze, which lasts to this day, uh, in understanding, treating, and curing this disorder. And in fact, that, that post continues to rank uh, very highly for search terms relevant for the disorder. And what that meant was that other patients and parents that were out there searching for uh, children like my son were able to find us. And so within a few months, we had uh, pa two patients in Turkey. And then at, shortly after that, we had two patients in Israel. And a few weeks after that, uh, we actually ended up with a patient right here in Palo Alto. And over the past few years, patients have been popping up all over the world, finding this blog post or finding some of the other stuff we set up on the internet or finding the papers that have now been published and getting in touch with us, uh, forming a community for the first time and really you know, washing away that darkness of isolation uh, with the comfort of, and power of community. And it is a community that is quite united today, a community that stands at 35 as, as of recent count. We're finding them uh, now at about a rate of about one every one to two weeks. Uh, and we've been able to answer, ask questions like, well, what can you do once you have 35 patients? And it turns out you can do an awful lot. Uh, so as soon as you start to um, amass a patient body, you end up with natural experiments, patients that have subtle variations in their, in their disorder or the strategy for treatment, and these, these give you information. So one example of that is this child right here, who not only had the misfortune of having uh, aggressive uh, liver cancer, or uh, uh, NGLY1, but also aggressive pediatric liver cancer, necessitating a full liver transplant. And the interesting thing is that after his liver transplant, and we don't fully understand why this is yet, is that he went seizure-free. So he's the only patient to go completely seizure-free and have a completely normalized DEG. Uh, and it seems to be a result of the liver transplant. So this natural experiment is pointing to a potential way for the rest of the patients to have a therapy. Uh, and it lets you do things like hold uh, conferences and workshops and symposia between patients and scientists. And depending on how you count, we've probably had about three or four of these by now, where patients and scientists uh, have been getting together and, and discussing strategies for moving forward. There are two nonprofit foundations dedicated to understanding, treating, and curing this disorder. Uh, and we've even been very lucky to have the NIH sponsor or our inclusion in a natural history study uh, for congenital disorders of glycosylation. And so we're very grateful to people like Lynn Wolf and to Bill Golf for sponsoring this study. And what I'll do is I'll just show you one picture uh, for every po prod procedure or appointment that occurs during this week-long extreme phenotyping uh, that goes on. And now around a third of all known cases of this disorder have been through this entire process. Uh, in yielding tremendous amounts of data about what this disorder is really doing. Uh, so I think it's astonishing that in less than a year we've been able to phenotype, like, again, a third of all known patients. And what you get from something like this is mounds of biomarkers. And biomarkers lead you into uh, next steps in action for therapeutics. So if you, one thing you might want to do in terms of therapies is high-throughput screening, you know, testing lots and lots of potential compounds against an assay, trying to rescue some feature of the disorder. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to build an assay, but my wife was smart enough to type in NGLY1 assay into Google and find a paper. 
Uh, it turns out there was a relatively recently published paper on how to build a fantastic assay for, for the, uh, the, the enzymatic activity here. We passed this along to Dr. Hudson Fries, who ramped it up into a very high resolution assay, which now sits as a potential foundation for actually doing high throughput screening, uh, you know, using robot, robots to test thousands of potential therapeutic compounds. Uh, and the internet can also tell you about or uh, in prevention of having to build new model organisms because by the time this disorder was discovered, we were lucky to already have um, several model organisms available, including mice, worms, and yeast. And thanks to um, you know, some of the patient foundations that are out there now, uh, like the Grace Wilsey Foundation, we also have more animal models. We have uh, flies and zebrafish. So again, I don't know anything about biologics, but Google knows plenty about um, enzymes. And in fact, you can search if, to see whether or not there's a synthetic enzyme on Google. And this is actually something my wife did yet again. And sure enough, you can just buy human Engli-1 straight off the internet. The only catch here is that synthetic Engli-1 costs about $402 per 10 micrograms, which you, if you extrapolate that to therapeutic quantities is about $2 million a week. Um, so we'll have to discuss that with the insurance companies. Uh, and we've been sort of engaged in a kind of ad hoc crowd screening, if you will, where people are just making suggestions on, on, the, on the internet, and we've ended up with a list of about 32 compounds. Uh, and the interesting thing is that these suggestions are really coming from all over the place. They're coming from traditional places. In fact, some are even, even from, from here at Stanford University. Um, but a lot are actually coming from places like Twitter and Reddit and Hacker News, places you wouldn't necessarily expect to be getting medical advice or scientific advice for that matter. Um, but I just want to share one, one quick anecdote once that's actually quite inspiring uh, for me uh, about an interaction we've had over Twitter over the past couple months where uh, a, a postdoc in Texas who's been working on a novel class of read through compounds, a completely new approach to this entire process, said, hey, you know, I, I'm actually looking for cells kind of like the ones your son has because I think it's sort of the optimum case for this class of compounds I'm working on. Could you send me some of your son's cells? So we, we had Dr. Free send cells out to this, this postdoc in Texas. He's been culturing them. Uh, he applied his compound, and over the weekend, I got a, I got a picture. And what this picture showed was it's a blot checking to see the levels of, of protein expressed in patient cells. And for the first time, it's, it's really hard to see here, uh, we actually have a tiny little dark blot down in the corner. Now, it's, it doesn't look like there's much there, but it's actually way more than I've ever seen on any other attempt at read-through. So it looks like we've potentially achieved some sort of initial uh, protein rescue on the very first try using this novel read-through approach. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ifs to stack up in, in front of us to see if we can get this all the way into the clinic someday, uh, but I think it's exciting that the internet has been able to push us down this, this, thera this therapeutic path. So, um, and I'm also quite excited, and you're going to hear a little more about this later, that we're, we're scaling up these efforts to reach out to the internet because Andrew Sue, who you're going to hear from uh, in just a moment, uh, has, has, is using Engli-1 as part of his Mark Secure project. Uh, and what Mark to Cure is going to enable is it's going to allow, allow volunteers on the internet to donate their time to bio-curate abstracts for uh, papers potentially related to Engli-1. So that if there's hidden knowledge locked away in the knowledge we already have, that's going to become accessible to us, and it's become, become knowledge we can mine and analyze in a reasonable fashion so that we can understand the connections between Engli-1 and other disorders and potential therapies for Engli-1 uh, and other disorders as well. And people always ask, can you, can you repeat something like this? Uh, the answer is yes, you can do it. You can definitely repeat this process of, of reaching out to the internet. I've seen it done several times. I've, I've had a lot of people ask me for advice on how to do this. I've, I've given them some help. Uh, since I don't have a lot of time here today, I will simply point you to a blog post that I wrote. Um, so if you go to blog.mite.net, you'll get my list of tips for how to reach out to the internet for things like uh, patient finding. And um, you know, uh, it, it, actually, if, if any of you ever need any advice, do feel free to contact me as well. I, I, again, I'm very happy to help people uh, along their own diagnostic odysseys. So my parting thought uh, is that we really need to rethink the phrase not actionable. And if, if I could, uh, I would argue that it's time to remove it from our, our medical vocabulary. Uh, because in the absence of all other alternatives, you can always do uh, science. Thank you. <laughs>